without further ado, I am going to get going. All right, great. So, hi everyone. My name is Tomiko Oskotsky, and I'm a research scientist in the Sirota Lab of the Baker Computational Health Sciences Institute at UCSF. And I am very pleased to be here with Eleni Roldan. She is formerly a bioinformatics programmer in the Sirota Lab and is currently a medical student at the Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine. And it is our privilege to share with you our data sharing and crowdsourcing approaches to advance preterm birth research. We're thrilled to talk with you about our preterm birth dream challenge that leverages publicly available microbiome data from multiple sources, including from our Marchadine sponsored data repository. First, some background information. As you may know, preterm birth is when delivery of a baby takes place before 37 weeks of gestation, and it's a significant cause of infant morbidity and mortality. It happens in approximately 10% of births worldwide and can result in a variety of adverse outcomes, such as respiratory illnesses, blindness, and cerebral palsy, with associated complications resulting in nearly 1 million deaths per year. It's been found, sorry, it, it's a condition that can infect, affect families as well. And it's been found that preterm birth may be associated with women who are on the younger or older, older end of the age spectrum with smoking and with twins, triplets, and other multiples. However, preterm birth is a condition that has been a challenge to understand, let alone to predict. The microbiome is a collection of all microbes, such as bacteria, fungi, viruses, and their genes that naturally live on our bodies and inside us. The microbiome may be mechanistically related to preterm birth. So here's a question. How can we predict those at higher risk of preterm birth based on the microbiome? There have been a lot of studies for preterm birth, but studies have been inconsistent in their findings. And due to their limited power and representation of populations, findings from these studies have not been generalizable. Combining data from multiple microbiome data sets would be a key step to having the results be generalizable to people all around the world, to people from different racial and ethnic groups, and more. However, combining data from microbiome studies is particularly challenging. Here's an example of a meta-analysis that was done by a very talented scientist who completed her postdoc in the Sirota lab, uh, Edith Kosti. She and her team found that bacterial vaginosis was associated with preterm birth. And also, they saw that there was higher bacterial diversity associated with preterm birth, particularly in the first trimester, as you can see in the graph here on the right. For this meta-analysis, Edith and her team used a mixed effects model where a lot went into adjusting the data by study and some information about the microbiome was lost. There's some, this theme is I guess repeated, the, the keynote speaker mentioned this as well, about losing some biological signal when you try to homogenize data across um, for technique issues. So for our preterm birth challenge, what our team wanted to do was to identify multiple vaginal microbiome data sets and combine them in a way that could pre preserve as much of the biological signal as possible. And that brings us to uh, the preterm birth dream challenge. And I will pass it over to my colleague, Eleni, who will tell you more about the data. Right, so as Tomiko said, this brings us to today and the birth of the preterm birth prediction dream challenge using microbiome data. Uh, we brought together uh, vaginal microbiome data from nine different studies that focused on pregnancy, preterm birth, and the vaginal microbiome um, to comprise our training data. The various data sets differed in the number of participants, samples, and data platforms as well. And many of these data sets can be found on the March of Dimes preterm birth research data repository. But ultimately, the training data that was given to participants was used to accomplish two things. One, predict preterm birth, which is defined as 37 weeks gestation, and two, predict early preterm birth, which is defined as less than 32 weeks gestation. And so when it comes to the data, the time and frequency of the collection varied by study, 
uh, shown here on the left are the time points at which different samples were cut from different pregnancies were collected uh, and broken down by study, as well as organized by term and preterm pregnancies. Studies also differed in the locations as shown in the bottom right and were mostly cohort studies rather than uh, case control studies. Another major difference is that studies used 16S or shotgun uh, sequencing. Uh, they had different variable region primers and used different sequ sequencing platforms, excuse me. Altogether, this provided both an analytic challenge as well as an opportunity. So some of the challenges of the challenge. Some of the initial problems that we encountered with uh, the microbiome data is really rooted in the way microbiome uh, studies are generally done. And the best way to illustrate this problem is um, I'd like you all to imagine um, sending a group of kids uh, with cameras to a zoo and asking all of the children to take pictures of the animals that they saw. And so what you have here is a set of images that we've gotten back from the kids. And I'll ask you, what do you think are the different images or different animals that they saw at the zoo that day? And you can kind of guess because you know what animals and different animals look like, uh, but the computational tools that analyze microbiome data don't. And as you can kind of glean from these images, all of the kids saw cats. Um, and so you have different bits and pieces of the cat, um, but really unless you know what a cat looks like or have a good sense of what different cats would look like, it's pretty tricky to figure that out. And even if you do know what a cat looks like, it's hard to tell if they saw the same cat or if they saw different cats. And now at this point, you're just kind of using subtle hints, um, like the color of the cat or maybe different patterns and stripes on the cat themselves. Uh, and so on. And really it's not that different if you're looking at microbiome data, where you kind of take these raw pictures, uh, sequences, and they kind of come back and tend to cluster more by the technique that was used to make them rather than the underlying biological differences. So in this figure uh, is an ordination plot where each dot represents a sample and they're colored by the study from which the specimen came from. And so right here on the left, you see that different samples kind of cluster together based on the study. So teal with teal, blue and blue, red and red. And um, some of our validation studies from Wayne State University and Stanford, the ones that are outlined in black, kind of overlap with that green study as well. Excuse me. Um, but all together, it's a little bit of a mess. Um, but what we've done is we've developed a novel technique called phylogenetic harmonization that can successfully bring this all together. Um, and a slight tangent, but I just wanted to say thank you again to our colleagues at Wayne State University and Stanford for supplying us with unpublished vaginal microbiome data to use in this challenge. And so now with this uh, phylogenetic harmonization technique, you have these bits and pieces of the cat and are able to bring them back together again. And so what you see on the right is after harmonization, all of the studies are really nicely uh, integrated with each other. And the tool that was used in this phylogenetic harmonization approach is called Maliampi, uh, which is short for the Maximum Likelihood Amplicon Pipeline created by Dr. Jonathan Golub. And as much as I'd love to go into great detail about the tool, it would be a little bit out of scope, but feel free to read the preprint and check it out at GitHub as well. And really, Maliampi was a great tool that helped us um, solve some of those initial problems that we saw um, in creating this challenge, but this wasn't our only problem. <laughs> and so I'll pass it back to Tomiko. Great, thank you, Eleni. As Eleni mentioned, the problem of bringing the data sets together was something that we were able to use Maliampi to resolve, but there were many other challenges that we faced. Um, another one was, for example, with the features in the data sets and how, in a way, this contributed to failed submissions by our challenge participants, um, which people may know if they were involved in it. And actually, just out of curiosity, a show of hands, how many people here took part in our microbiome dream challenge for preterm birth prediction? Okay, a, a few hands in the audience, great. Um, so as you may recall, um, there were several features that we um, provided in the challenge data that you were able to work with, including phylotype, taxa, 
diversity, demographics, community state types, and more. Uh, and nearly all these features were generated by Maliampi. Um, having all these features was a good thing, uh, we think, for our challenge, but it also presented a challenge. Um, as individuals here may know, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the microbiome across time within any individual. As this site illustrates, it shows the vaginal microbiome and how it changes over time in term pregnancy, preterm pregnancy, and early preterm pregnancy. Furthermore, between individuals, only about a third of our microbiome may be similar, meaning there's a lot of variation in microbiome across individuals. This brings us to what we saw during the challenge is what some of the people here may have seen when they were participating um, with Docker submissions failing, uh, which was a real head scratcher for those of us who are organizing the challenge. But when we considered the heterogeneity of the microbiome across individuals, the biological sparseness of the data, it made sense why this was happening. The same features were not represented in the training and validation data sets. So what the participants saw uh, features wise may have been slightly different from what we had for the validation data uh, is very simply illustrated in the top two tables uh, here on this slide. Uh, basically, there's so much underlying biological variability that some of the features weren't represented in both data sets. So what we needed to do, the challenge organizers, that is, we needed to make sure that the same features were represented across both data sets. And so that's very simply illustrated in the table down here below. We basically needed to create some additional columns and some of those just had zero values, but we needed to make sure that the same features were in both training and validation data sets. And as challenge participants may remember, there was an updated version of the training data set that we released a few weeks before the end of the challenge. And this was for that reason. And once the dream challenge was over, another challenge we faced was with validating models that our participants had submitted. For both task one and task two, the dream challenge organizers, we had decided to use the area under the receiver operator curve to rank participants' models. And the two sub-challenges that we had were um, the prediction of preterm birth which is the um, birth prior to 37 weeks of gestation. And the validation data set that we used for that consisted of samples collected no later than 32 weeks of gestation. For task two or sub-challenge two, the prediction of early preterm birth, uh, which is birth that takes place before 32 weeks of gestation. The validation data set included samples that were collected no later than 28 weeks of gestation. And to clarify, we chose to omit samples from the validation data sets that were a few weeks before the threshold for preterm birth or early preterm birth in order to minimize any potential for data leakage. When validating the persistence models, one issue we saw was that for binary predictions for task two, for example, the early preterm birth prediction, some submissions had all zeros or just predictions of term birth which resulted in some models giving a sensitivity of zero, um, meaning that the model was not picking up any early preterm birth cases. Uh, there were some concerns that the area under the receiver operator curve could result in good performance metrics simply because of the imbalanced nature of the validation data set, which consisted of 13 out of over 140 that were early preterm for task two. So for our dream challenge, we wanted to be certain of participants' rankings. And so we took various strategies in order to validate participants' models. And these included bootstrapping, inverting probabilities, undersampling, as well as oversampling. And I just want to give kudos to Alice Tang, Jonathan Golub, Marina Chung, and Jake Albrecht for all their magnificent work in validating the models. On the top left, you can see the AUROCs for a sub-challenge one, which is the preterm birth prediction. Um, and on the right, you see the AUROCs when using a validation data set with inverted labels. That is where term cases were labeled as preterm and vice versa, where preterm cases were labeled as term. And here we see that the AUROCs, um, the rankings, particularly of the top teams, remains consistent. And actually, probably because of the really tiny font, you can't read the names, 
but that's okay. I'll show you who the winners are later. Um, down below, you see for the bootstrapping, uh, what the AU ROCs were. And we bootstrapped a thousand times, um, a hundred, uh, we sampled a hundred from 140 or so uh, from the validation data set. And these are the box plots showing the ranges of the AU ROCs. And as again, you can see, if you can read the tiny font, that the top ranked teams remain the same. And here are the AU ROCs for the undersampling and the oversampling of the validation data sets. We have the bootstrap AU ROCs for the undersampling on the left, oversampling on the right. And again, the top ranked teams remain consistent. This is the validation work for the um, second sub-challenge, which is the early preterm birth prediction. On the left are the AU ROCs from the sub-challenge that the participants saw. On the right are the AU ROCs from inverting the probabilities and down below for the bootstrapping. And again, we see that the rankings, particularly for the top teams, remain consistent. And again, these are the AU ROCs for the undersampling and the oversampling from the validation data set. And we see the same consistency in the rankings. So after seeing that the top ranked teams were consistent after extensive cross-validation work, we felt comfortable and confident in announcing who our winners are, which bring us to the results of our dream challenge. By the time our dream challenge ended, we had 318 individuals and teams register for our challenge, and we received 148 submissions for sub-challenge one and 240, sorry, two, 121 submissions for sub-challenge two. And here are the winners of our preterm birth prediction dream challenge. For task one, the University of Wisconsin-Madison team and the AI for Knowledge lab are our first and second place winners. Their models were able to achieve AU ROCs of about 0.69 and 0.64 uh, respectively, which was better than our baseline models. For task two, the Techman lab and the KBJ team were our first and second place winners. And their models were able to achieve, achieve AU ROCs of about 0.87 and 0.84 respectively, again, better than our baseline models. One thing that we saw in these teams and other teams, top ranking teams submitted models was that many use ensemble methods for their predictions. And we are very fortunate because we have members from these winning teams here today who will be talking with you about their work a little bit later during this session. So what's next for those of us who are organizing this dream challenge? Well, our immediate next step is to work with challenge participants and to share our findings from this dream challenge to identify pregnancies at risk for preterm birth. We aim to dive deeper into the findings and learn how it is that the microbiome may increase or decrease the risk of preterm birth. And ultimately, it is our hope to reduce the risk of preterm birth by possibly changing the microbiome. And with that, there are many people that we would like to acknowledge, including members of the Sirota Lab, Marina Sirota, Alice Tang, Eleni Roldan, Jackie Roger, Jean Costello, Brian Lee, Edith Costi, Gaia Andrelletti, and many, many others who help provide great insight and help into this challenge. The UCSF microbiome colleagues, including Susan Lynch, Connie Ha, and others who helped us with process processing some vaginal microbiome samples um, and the data we were able to use as part of our validation data set. Our Periton colleagues who help us with developing and maintaining our March of Dimes preterm birth research data repository and members from Stanford, including David Stevenson, Nima Agekor, Ron Wong, who generously shared vaginal microbiome data sets that we were able to uh, process and um, use that data as part of our unpublished validation data set. Um, of course, members of our dream team, including Jonathan Golub, Jim Costello, Adi Tarka from Wayne State, he shared um, unpublished vaginal microbiome data that we were able to use for our validation data set. Uh, Verena Chung, Caitlin Flynn, Jake Albrecht, and many, many others from the dream team without whose help, organizing this dream challenge would not have been possible. 
and of course, the Marcha Dimes, Emery Selly, Jonathan Cherry, Courtney Dower, and many, many others. Um, without their very generous funding and support, we would not have been able to bring this challenge together. And I just wanted to mention that the Marcha Dimes sponsors six prematurity research centers that each has different themes in, uh, with respect to their research work in preterm birth. And our March of Dimes Prematurity Research Center at UCSF, led by Marina Sirota, is involved with data sharing, our data repository work, uh, crowdsourcing approaches, as well as computational drug repositioning and leveraging the electronic medical record data to study pregnancy outcomes. Our preterm birth research data repository, uh, which includes microbiome data, um, in addition to the data that we used, a lot of it came from the March of Dimes um, data repository. We also have GWAS data, proteomics, CITOF, and a lot, lot more. Um, I invite you to visit uh, preterimbirthdb.org for more information, as well as um, to um, get data for your, uh, for any work that involves preterm birth research. And this is a picture of people from our lab at an outing um, out in San Francisco on a sunny day, which is not common in the summer. So anyway, thank you very much for your time and attention and we're happy to take questions. Sure. Yeah, so the vaginal microbiome, well, that's what we use in this particular challenge. And that's collected from, um, for this challenge, collected from patients who were pregnant all throughout different times, um, usually with a swab. And those can be frozen or otherwise preserved and then sequenced. And so what we're sequencing is the um, genetic material from these organisms. So from the bacteria, from the viruses, from the fungi, all these different organisms that live within us. And um, there are various techniques. Uh, 16S is one method. There's also whole genome sequencing where you uh, sequence the entire genome of these um, organisms. And the tricky thing with the 16S method that we were talking about is that they can use different regions. Um, they're called uh, sequence variants. They can use different regions for the sequencing. So that's why, like, like that analogy that Eleni was showing you earlier, you end up getting different pictures of these organisms that you're trying to bring together when you're doing a meta-analysis. Um, and that's the tough thing. But when you have a tool like Malianthi that's able to homogenize these data um, by using what's called a phylogenetic reference tree. So it's like a, having the whole picture of the animal and you're able to take all these bits and kind of hang those little bits onto these big pictures, then you have a sense of what it is represented in your data. Hey. Hi, my name is Abby Kunselman. Um, I'm a lab tech in Dr. Stephen Techman's lab at Michigan Technological University. Um, and the work I'm about to talk about is uh, the work that we did for the early preterm labor prediction, which is task two. So all of this work was in collaboration with Isaac Bigcraft, who is a PhD candidate at Dr. Techman's lab. So about 10% of infants are born premature, and I have before 36 weeks here, but it should be before 37, so apologies for that. Um, and then about 2% are born early preterm, which is defined as before 32 weeks of gestational age. And this graph from LaRocque et al. 2003 shows um, on the x-axis is gestational age, and then the y-axis is percentage of survival. So before 23 weeks, there's a really low chance of survival, um, but once the gestational age reaches 32 weeks, the percentage of survival goes almost 100%. So before 32 weeks, um, there's a pretty significant risk for infants born in this time. And it's important to try to figure out what's happening here um, and how we can help figure out the risks for early preterm labor, um, especially because preterm birth rate has been rising in the US for the past couple of years. So this challenge involved 3,600 3, vaginal microbiome samples from about 1,300 different individuals. The data were imbalanced, so there are about twice as many individuals that deliver term as delivered preterm. And then the other um, presentations have talked about this a little bit, but all of the data avail available to us were diversity metrics about the microbiome, community state types, metadata, 
about the patient, such as race and age, and then reads and relative abundances organized by different phylogenetic cutoffs, as well as pairwise distances between the different phylotypes. So I'm actually going to talk a little bit about what we did for task one, because this is where we put the majority of our effort, um, and again, before 37 weeks. So what we wanted to do was see if we could create a method, or not create, but use a method that generates more data, because in general, more data makes a more accurate uh, model. And that's especially a problem with microbiome samples is that there's generally not enough data. So we used a generative adversarial network, or GAN, to see if we could generate more samples and then train our models on these samples. And the way a GAN works is that you have um, a generator network, which takes in real samples and generates fake samples that look like those real samples. And then a discriminator network, network, which takes in the generated fake samples as well as real samples, and then decides if the fake samples pass as real samples. And then based on what the discriminator decides, uh, the generator can fine tune its approach to continue making samples that look more and more like the real samples. So of course, this is a great approach um, for introducing more data. And it's also possible that it could introduce variants that you might not see in your training data um, of real samples, but you might see in, in testing data. But of course, these models or these samples are not biologically accurate. So it might make a more accurate model, but you might not be able to say a whole lot about these samples biologically. So Isaac got to work. Um, he set up the GAN and generated. We, we focused on just relative abundance data um, organized by phylotypes of the cutoff of 0.1. We generated 5,000 preterm samples and 5,000 term samples. And then we have some ordination plots which show how similar the generated data was to the real data. So this is a TSNE plot. In the green and red are preterm and term generated samples, and then blue and orange are preterm and term real samples. So you can see that the generated data did make its own cluster. Um, so it's kind of similar to the real data, but it does make its own cluster. And one idea about this um, is that the GAN never produced relative abundance values of zero exactly. It produced values very close to zero, but never exactly zero. So it could be that the TSME plot is picking up that similarity between the generated samples. Um, and then we also have an MVS and PCA plots, which again show that the generated data is close to the real data, but there are definitely some obvious trends that we can see um, that's not seen in the real data. So we trained two models on these generated um, data, and then only one model on real samples. Um, model one was a random forest, and then model two was a support vector machine. And then for our third model, we had seen and kind of tinkering around with the data beforehand that some other um, metrics outside of just the relative abundances were important for the model's decision making, such as the diversity metrics, um, race and collect week, and then community state types. So we included that as well. Uh, we took a very bare bones approach to this. We just used default scikit-learn hyperparameters, and we did not do any feature selection. So to test these models for models one and two, we just trained them on generated data and then tested them on the real data. And then for model three, we did a five-fold cross-validation, 80% um, training data, 20% testing data. And model three outperformed models one and two um, in all the different areas. So there's the area under the ROC curve and the PRC curve and then accuracy. And for all of these categories, the model trained on real data outperformed the models trained on generated data. And we have two ideas about this. One is that the metadata has a greater impact on model decision than each of the individual phylotypes. Um, and then also we could improve the GAN um, to make sure that it's generating samples that look more like the uh, real samples that we had available to us. So now I'll go into what we did for task two, which was early preterm birth prediction, um, defined as before 32 weeks of gestational age. We actually only ran one basic random forest classifier, so that means um, no hyperparameter tuning or feature selection, trained on just the real samples. And the data we used was very similar to the data used for model three of task one, which is um, just the relative abundances, diversity metrics, race and collect week, and then community state types. And we did a five-fold cross-validation um, to see how our model did on our own. And we got an ROC measure of 0.57 and a PRC of 0.45, and then accuracy was 0.92. But when the Dream Challengers went to test it on the validation data set, um, the accuracy and the PRC measures are the exact same, but the ROC measure was actually higher than what we had when we did our five-fold cross-validation. Um, so it could be our ROCs tend to be a little more sensitive to imbalances. So it could be that the validation data set was more imbalanced than the training set. But we we're also thinking that it's possible that our model was not too overtuned to the training data. So it was able to generalize a little bit better 
to an outside data set. And then we looked at the top 200 most important features that um, went into the model's decision making. Diversity metrics and collect week were the top uh, features for that. And then of the next 192 or so features, there were three different races and five different community state types that showed up as being very important for the model's decision making. So as has been mentioned before, um, uh, greater vaginal microbiome diversity is linked with preterm birth. So we were expecting to see the same thing here. We were expecting to see um, that early preterm samples were linked with a more diverse microbiome. Uh, so these are block plots of, and blue is post 32 weeks and orange is early preterm. And then the x-axis is just all the different diversity metrics. And what we actually found was that for each of those, um, there was no significant difference between early preterm and post 32 weeks, which is kind of interesting because these were the most important uh, features that the model used to make its decision. Um, so each of the diversity metrics on their own are not really good predictors of early preterm birth. We also knew that there was a previous correlation between um, Black and African American people and preterm birth, so we expect to see, to see the same thing here. But what we actually found was that for white and Black or African American, there was no significant difference. Um, but being Asian was very strongly correlated with early preterm birth. So this was a bit of a surprise because previous, stu previous studies have shown that um, being Asian is correlated with less risk of preterm birth. And then these are the five community state types that showed up in the top 200 features. Um, only two of them were significant. So community state type five was associated with post 32 week birth. And then community state type 3B was associated with early preterm birth. But the other community state types were not, um, did not show any significant difference between post 32 week and early preterm birth. And then here I have the um, top five phylotypes um, and their average values. So Prevotilla bivia and urea plasma urea lidicum were both strongly co correlated with early preterm birth, while um, Lactobacillus jensenii and Lactobacillus crispatus were more correlated with uh, post 32 week birth. And Lactobacillus crispatus is very close to the p-value cutoff, but I included it anyway, because it is very close. Um, and in kind of looking at the literature, it does look like Lactobacillus is associated with um, a colonization of the vaginal microbiome for term births. So this is kind of expected. So overall, we found that the microbiome can be used to predict preterm birth and then to a lesser extent, early preterm birth. Um, but each single feature does not actually predict early preterm birth on its own. And rather, the model is picking up some complex relationship between each of the features um, that is not easily detectable by traditional statistical methods. And of course, I think we need to do more work to make a more accurate early preterm birth model because um, the accuracy was good, but the, the precision recall curve could, could be improved. So what we were thinking is that we could train on only early preterm versus term samples instead of early preterm versus post 32 week samples. And then of course we can continue refining the GAN to make it um, produce data that is more similar to the real data and also apply this method to early preterm birth prediction as well. So thank you so much to the Dream Challenge organizers, especially for having us here. I'm super excited to be in Las Vegas. It's a lot of fun to be here. And then of course to Isaac Bigcraft for his work with again, and then Dr. Stephen Techman, who advised both of us on this project. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you for the great talk. So you mentioned for the better GAN model for the future of So what does that cause the bias of the model? Because now you can really the data set which is kind of pretty close to what you're you have. And that will cause the bias of the model to be specific for it. And that can affect the generation of the data. So, how do you solve it? Okay, so the question was um, if you make more data that look more like the real samples, then you'll be more biased toward the data set that you're training on. Is that right? Yeah. And then, um, how would we uh, deal with that in the future? Um, there have been some methods that actually take data from a different um, data set and then sort of transform it to look like the data set that you're working with. So that, that might introduce some variance. Um, and then if you wanna come find us afterwards, Isaac did a lot of the work with the GAN. Um, he's over there. So you can come find us and talk to us about that later. And we'd love to yeah, talk about that and hear your ideas. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the great talk. Uh, we have two questions. One, of course, is related to the GAN, because GANs are known to have problems with more collapsing and you will get a solution which is more close to the mean. That's what you are also observing that your cases are all distinct together away from the real data. The 
second question is basically related to you see something very interesting, which is like a simple random forest model, which is the one which is training. So, you think that it can be converted into a monograph, which is basically like you can now convert it into a rule based uh, system, which can be used by the clinician to basically see whether you have big term problems or not. So, we basically convert it into an experimental model, much more experimental model that can be easily used by the clinician. So are you asking if it can, oh, sorry, repeat it again. Yeah, if it can be converted, it's not important how that it has, can it be converted or Converted into? A simple, like, kind of experimental model, which a clinician can use. Oh, I see. That would be interesting or not for you, for example. Because ultimately, you need to have it in the building, right? Whatever you're doing, you create a predictive model. But it has to, in the end, own the building, so that they can use it to say that there's a possibility of uh, yeah, so you're, so you're asking if um, we can better explain the random forest model that we used? Yeah, so I think um, looking at some of the features that the model reported as being important for its decision making is one way that you could explain how it's working. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm actually not super familiar with the theory behind random forest models, so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you could look into how the how the random forest is making its decision to have more a better explanation now. Thank you. Yeah, so I think um, it's definitely possible that some of the variants introduced by the GAN helped, but I think some of the questions earlier um, indicated that that actually brings things closer to the mean. Uh, so, and actually for uh, early preterm birth prediction, we did not use the GAN. So the ROC um, being higher for the validation data set, we did not use the GAN for that part. So that had no impact on early preterm birth prediction. <clears throat> Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> Um, I am Yun Kim from, I'm a member of the team KJ. Uh, I'm gonna present the work we did for the Britain Birth Prediction Challenge. So this is the table of contents for today's pr presentations. Uh, before moving on to the, the work we did, I'm gonna briefly introduce the, the Britain Birth. Um, the pregnant birth is important because around 11% of the pregnant women actually give the preterm birth. So, and also it can lead to some various diseases, including the breathing pro problems or the blood problems, and even to, it can lead to the, the death. So. Um, it has been a lot of researches on um, the factors of the preterm birth. Of course, there are a lot of factors. Um, among them, this the, the increase of the diversity in vaginal microbiome can lead to the preterm birth. So um, there have been a lot of researches, and um, some microbiomes. My, some microbiota were known to uh, have some correlations with this preterm birth. So, um, as many presenters already to show that, uh, there are mainly two tasks in this preterm birth prediction challenge. Uh, since we won the second place for the task two, I'm gonna uh, focus on the results of the task two prediction of the early preterm birth. Mm -hmm but we follow the same pipeline for both tasks. Um, this is the overview of our approaches. Uh, there are mainly three uh, steps, the data pre-processing, feature selections, and the model constructions. Um, I'm gonna go on the details in the next slides. This is the summary of the data sets we've got for this challenge. Um, there are around 3,600 samples and uh, 1,300 individuals. And we follow 
we did some data pre-processing, filtering by the collecting wet conditions, uh, because the to make this data to be under the same condition as the test data set. And because the, the model was validated at the level of the participants, we averaged over all those samples to the particip uh, participant level. And you can see the use features uh, under here. We used all those data retrieved from the MoliMP pipeline except the pairwise distance. And we used, <coughs> excuse me, we used the race data from the metadata set. You can see here, um, there are two challenges that make it hard to predict the early preterm. The first one is that um, the data is very imbalanced. And the second one is that uh, the size of the, the dimensions of the features are very large uh, compared to the data set size uh, because the total number of the features that collected from these uh, feature lists were more than the 15,000. So we, to overcome this limited, this problem, uh, we did the feature selections um, there are many methods for the feature selections. Among them, we applied this minimum redundancy maximum relevance, MRMR approach. Uh, it is quite simple. Uh, just pick the first features, uh, the first feature, and then uh, iteratively select the other features to make um, these features to be less uh, to have less redundancy, but uh, max to maximize the relevance between the feature sets and the Y labels. So we did this until the total number, number of selected features to be 300. And we applied this feature selection method to three types of features because the dimensions of these threes were too high. <clears throat> And the second approach to overcome the data, the limited data set data size, uh, we constructed an ensemble model. Um, firstly, um, we used the lazy predict Python package to construct 26 different machine learning based models. Um, of course, we could rank the model by the model performances. Uh, through the fivefold cross validations. And then we selected the best performing models that ranked in more than two folds. After that, we constructed ensemble models um, using these the selected models. So I'm going to show you the results here. The first one is that uh, the impact of the feature selections. Uh, we draw these PCA plots, and you can see that um, after the feature selections, the data sets could be dis discriminated. Um, you can see um, the, sam the samples are very um, close together before the, before the feature selections, but uh, you can see that, you can see some these selected features can discriminate these early preterm and term samples. Also, we constructed the, the, mo the model, and you can see the, the, five, the results from the five-fold cross-validations. And of course, be, uh, without the feature selections, um, the model performed uh, showed very random performance. The AUC values were around 0.5. And this is the actual result of our model. Um, because we could not get the test data set, this is the result of the cross validations. And this blue line is the, the performance of the ensemble model. And the rest are the single uh, machine learning model that used to construct the ensemble model. You can see that through uh, by combining these all the other models, it performed very well. 
And this is the result of the test that <clears throat> uh, you can see the values uh, on the website. And the point uh, is the point of this the test that performance is that uh, our model showed very balanced sensitivity and specificity. Um, although the data sets were very imbalanced and we did not use any approaches for the undersampling or oversampling um, the data. Uh, so you know, uh, we can say that the model can predict the both positives and the negatives data as well. And the last thing is the, the feature interpretation. Uh, it actually showed very interesting um, results. We looked into the top 10 the features, top 10 the taxonomy features. Uh, actually, we used the taxonomy features at the genus level. And among the top 10 features, we could actually found, find the, the known microbial or organisms in Prittenberg through the literature search. And these green are the known the organisms and the blue one is the, the genus that were uh, related to the vaginal microbiota, but not the actual, the Prittenberg. And we expect these red <laughs> organisms or maybe uh, the new, the maybe the new uh, microbiota that can be related to this preterm birth. And likewise, we looked into this top five the CAC, CST uh, features and it showed the similar <coughs> results um, in through these the interpretation, we found that this lactobacillus and the genus Prevotella are highly related to the uh, Preton bird. So in summary, uh, we used these two approaches, feature selections and the construction of the ensemble models to uh, get the high performance. And the model should uh, we, our model actually ranked in the second place in task two. And uh, since uh, because of the limited number of the submission, uh, we could not test all the hyperparameters and uh, hyperparameters. So um, the model could be, can be <coughs> uh, improved uh, with the more elaborate um, feature selection. So this is end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for the Dream Challenge organizers and my, uh, thank you for my team members. Our team uh, members are from two different institutes, uh, Korean Bioformation Center um, and the Bioformatics and Intelligence Lab in GIST. Thank you. Thank you.